When there's no more room in hell, the dead will listen to Bloodfest the podcast. Hello, and welcome back to Bloodfest the podcast. I'm your host, Nate. Y'all know me, know what I do for a living. I'm joined tonight, as always, by my good friend Josh. Josh, how are you doing tonight? Hey, I'm doing pretty good. I'm supposed to be like third. What are you doing? I know, I'm mixing it up. I'm mixing it up. And and also, I'm joined by Casey. Casey, what's going down? Not much. Just happy to be here, like normal. And as always, our technical director, Joey, is over here, but refuses to be on camera because his pretty face will drive you all mad. Say hi, Joey. Hey, everybody. Hey, Larry. Good to have you on. Hey, Joe. We are super excited to to uh, bring you a, an amazing guest tonight. The absolute master of horror, Larry Fessenden, is joining us. Larry, I want to thank you so much for being here. So how's the world treating you? All is well. I'm in the East Coast and uh, hanging in there. Yeah. Oh, yeah. How's the weather out there? It's all right. Uh, wintry mix that's the new kind of weather we have wintry mix we had a little bit a little bit of that uh, a couple of days ago so we're in kansas and missouri so we're we're right in the middle of the of the country and we've gotten we've gotten a little fun weather so the very first thing i want to talk to you about tonight larry so it's it's actually a movie that was never made so you wrote and you were set to direct a remake of the orphanage that was going to be produced by guillermo del toro but then i guess the studio kind of wimped out on it and and pulled the plug which was a huge disappointment honestly so what i'm really curious about do you see any any future for you and del toro to work again at some point together and and also if there's a second season of his Cabinet of Curiosities over at Netflix, do you think you'll be involved in that? Uh, well, maybe. I mean, he wrote me recently and said for sure. Uh, you know, that uh, little, I guess it was a tweet or maybe it was a interview, but I it was a surprise to me, but very sweet uh, to read that. Because so Guillermo and I, you know, we worked very closely on Orphanage for a year or so. And then I was in The Strain as an actor, which yeah. was just a way to sort of continue our relationship. Uh, then we, we didn't talk much for a while. Um, and then uh, and then he made that tweet or whatever it was, interview. So, you know, and then I was in contact with him when he was promoting Pinocchio very recently right. in New York. And, you know, he said for sure he'd bring me on board if we did cabinets again. Now, I don't know. Netflix has their own way of. Yeah. making decisions it's unclear if the show will go through we, but anyway guillermo is a lovely guy and uh very supportive he's often saying nice things about my old film habit mm-hmm. and uh yeah he's just a great presence in all of our lives you know he he seems like the type of guy who really cares about supporting other creatives and and helping people and making sure people get noticed so i know that you're the same kind of same kind of guy um in fact that's going to make me jump way ahead in my questions because I wanted to ask you about um, – so you you were kind of a mentor to Ty West and Kelly Reichert and Jim Mickle. Do you feel like as, as someone of your stature in the community that you have a responsibility to do that for, for younger creators to kind of support them and help them along the way and make sure people know about them? Well, it's just – the way I'm wired, and uh, you know, I always like to say that I make a certain type of uh, genre film, um, but I have a lot of enthusiasm for uh, other ways of uh, of making movies. So I just really enjoy seeing other filmmakers uh, reach their uh, potential. And with Mikkel, I, I really loved his early films and. He wanted to be, you know, my coffee boy. It's so sweet. Some of these old emails that he wrote, uh-huh. Dear Mr. Fessenden and all of this, and I was in his first film. Um, and uh, then when I had the opportunity, I had some money from MPI, which is a Chicago-based mm-hmm. genre uh, factory. And I thought of Mikkel, and I thought, I wonder 
if he could uh, step up and do this show. As for Ty, I met him out of college. He was an intern of mine. Oh, okay. Really liked his work, uh, his shorts. And I say, hey, kid, if you ever graduate and uh, want to make a feature, uh, come, let's let's talk. So, you know, and Kelly, uh, she cast me in a movie, and then I ended up helping her edit. So they're very organic relationships, mm -hmm. but it has to do with my enthusiasm for... Uh, for movies i just love the process and you know you can't be the director of every movie but you can be involved in getting other people to do their best work so like a couple of years ago kelly had a movie nominated for the oscars uh ty is like everywhere right now with x and pearl and and maxine is coming so he's like dominating the conversation when, when you see that from from someone that that you kind of helped along do you do you feel like a great sense of pride do you feel like that's partially your accomplishment too a little bit especially the ones that uh ty is very you know he just well, all of these guys we're talking about, there's a continuity. You know, they still call me and ask me to read their scripts, and I'm not saying that I'm essential to their process, but there's a friendship, there's an acknowledgement of our past together, and that is gratifying, like any kind of parental figure. <laughs> I enjoy it. And, uh, and you know, I was in a lot of Ty's movies. Yeah. I was in the Western he did with Travolta, and it was very sweet that he asked me. He had to fight for me because I'm not known to the studios um so yeah it's very nice and, and same with kelly she always is very kindly mentions me in her talks because we did start out together and i gave her a lot of advice about filmmaking okay so i wanted to to shift gears just a little bit so back at the beginning one of your first features habit was your take on the vampire mythos and then a couple of years ago you gave us depraved which was your frankenstein story i know blackout that's coming out later this year do we have a release date on that no no i i mean i haven't quite finished it but uh you know i gotta sell it it's oh, oh. i'm still just selling my wares like a lot of indie filmmakers so I, I know that's your werewolf movie. What I'm wondering is, are you creating kind of your own version of the, the Universal Monsters universe? Is that is that something that you feel like you're, you want to do or what you're doing? It is what I'm doing, isn't it? <laughs> so are we going to see more of it? What's that? Are we going to see more? Or is there going to be is there going to be Larry Fessenden's The Mummy or Larry Fessenden's The Invisible Man or Everyone always asks about the mummy. What yes, the, fuck the mummy's the mummy? amazing. I'm not making a mummy oh, movie. <laughs> well, what about the Invisible Man or Creature from the Black Lagoon? Oh well, that would be quite special. Uh, I I had a great Invisible Man project. It was just me producing for uh, the filmmaker J T. Petty. Mm -hmm. It was incredible. We fought very hard, and I actually did eventually get the money, but. Uh, he had sort of moved on. It took so long. Anyway, that's a disappointment because it was great. Um, Creature, sure, I'd love yeah. to do it. I gotta figure out how to do the soup. I did make a movie for uh, um, called Hypothermia with uh, my filmmaker friend uh, James McKinney made that. And um, but my own journey is to make a sequel to Blackout, if anyone will have it, and I intend to uh, uh, possibly have all my monsters in one movie so that would, oh, that be, would be awesome <laughs> oh that would be awesome awesome so have you given any thought to so you obviously you you produce a lot through glass eye pictures and scare flicks have you thought about ever letting some young upcoming filmmaker jump into your universe like letting someone make their continuation of habit you know where we can find that there were other vampires in new york i mean assuming that Anne is actually a vampire but but where someone else could build on that is that something you've ever given any thought to i haven't thought of that exactly but uh anything's possible i mean i i you know it's an organic process making movies and you have to find the money and the right people and the right passion and the good script and all the usual things to make something happen. So, I mean, I don't know. I don't want a whole bunch of people sending me habit at, uh, <laughs> the script, but, um, but anything's possible. Sure, man. I, I, I just throw like, away that script I gave you. 
Don't yeah, do Joey. <laughs> Come on, don't. I, I'm burning it now. It's going in the trash. <laughs> Damn. Well, all right. Send it up. <laughs> so I, your your film. So I I generally people talk about all the subgenres of horror. And I generally think whatever the subgenre, you can split horror into two categories. Movies that are just meant to be scary or gory or something, but movies that are actually about something, so, social commentary. And I, I see your films as that class of movies. Um, so Last Winter is ecological horror. It's about how we're destroying the planet and the ways that the planet might fight back. Uh, Wendigo talks about the horrors of colonialism, the spread of empire, and how that affected native populations and how it affects us still today. Um, I, it feels like most of your films, or many of your films at least, carry kind of a rebuttal of American exceptionalism. Um, so my question is, how important is the social commentary, the larger subject. When you sit down to write, do you do you start with, I want to make a movie that's telling everyone about this problem, or do you think of a story and then the commentary develops as you're writing and as you're making the film? Well, I don't want to keep using this word, but it's all holistic. In other words, so you make a werewolf movie. I mean, I love monsters. So if I'm going to make a werewolf movie, I think about what what is the werewolf metaphor kind of mean? How is it relevant? And, you know, the reality is that the reason we always talk about remakes being annoying is that there's the feeling that people are just cashing in on old ideas, whereas what we want to see is a movie that's relevant to the moment, you know, that comes from not necessarily the, the news or the, mm -hmm. God forbid, the current politics, but that comes from the concerns and fears of the day. I mean, remember, that's the beauty of horror. You have Godzilla because there was an atom bomb dropped on, uh, you know, uh, those nice folks. And then um, so they sort of try to deal with it um, by coming up with a metaphor. And that's true just endlessly through, through the horror genre. And so I want to make movies that feel current, that feel urgent to the moment, and yet have some fun. So I'm not, I don't sit down and say, you know, what is the issue of the day? I'm going to make a movie about the crisis of taxation. <laughs> <laughs> but, uh, yeah, I, I think, I think uh, horror is so exciting because it should feel uh, vital to the moment. Okay, yeah. Um, okay, so staying in that same vein with social commentary, personally, I'm a big fan, fan of zombie movies, with the ones that are done well you know, Romero, for instance, because it seems like the zombie metaphor has a lot of plasticity and it can be used for a lot of that type of commentary. Do, do you think there's ever a chance that we're going to see you tackle a zombie film, that we'll see the Larry Fessenden zombie movie? Absolutely. I have the script. Oh, I, outstanding. I nice. couldn't get it produced, but I don't always try hard enough. <laughs> uh, I Anyway, it's... It's a great script, and I, you know, it, it. I could come back to it, and they're not quite zombies, but they're a lot of trouble, and you obviously know that you're in a kind of a zombie genre. So, yeah, and then naturally, I also produced uh, Stakeland, which is yeah, apocalyptic. It has a political vibe, but those aren't zombies; they're vampires. Yeah. I yeah. don't think. Uh, yeah. But you know, the point is, is uh, yeah, and and zombies. Of course, starting with Romero, Night of the Living Dead is certainly one of my very favorite movies, and the, the sort of the vibe of that, it captures the dissatisfaction from the late 60s, mm -hmm. you know, the sense of despair and just the feeling of collapse. Little did they know where we were all headed, <laughs> but back in the 60s, it mm -hmm. almost seems quaint, but we <laughs> had Vietnam and, the, and uh, you know, racial strife and... Uh, the cities were on fire, and so this was such an amazing response. Without being preachy, I mean, yeah, it, uh, that's what's great about Romero, and he continued to be political in his work, obviously. Yeah. Oh, yeah. The Crazies, Dawn of the Dead, both powerful, powerful political films. Yeah. 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 Big, big fan. Big fan of Romero. Um. So to get to get a little darker, so. 
as I said before, I see a, a big rebuttal of American exceptionalism in a lot of your work. Um, colonialism, the, the effects of Manifest Destiny still playing out today. Um, so we look at the news this week, and we see what happened with the police in Mississippi with them beating a black man to death, and we all had to see that. And it feels like that's a, a story that we see almost every week from somewhere in this country. Do you... As an artist, do you feel like you have a responsibility to to raise the alarm about where we are and what's going wrong in the country? Um, well, I wouldn't say it is every artist's responsibility. It's just uh, as much as I love genre and whatever version of escapism that implies, I'm also very engaged in like, how do you build a good society? Where, what are the choices that we all should be making? And, you know, what, what are the things that we value? What is the meaning of life? You know, there's just, for whatever reason, I find these to be essential uh, things to be thinking about. You know, I hang out with friends and we rage about this or that. And so that creeps in my films, then even if I want to tell a werewolf story, I'm going to think about the the relevance. So, yeah, I, I just don't quite see art without an engagement with the bigger issues of, you know, the meaning of life and, mm -hmm. uh, and all that stuff. I mean, what's the point of it all? Yeah. I mean, I just have an existential perspective. Mm -hmm. And so I'm always trying to understand why don't we get along better why are people mean to each other? Uh, you know, what's the corruption? What has capitalism done to our brains? Uh, whatever, AI, all these things, you know, that, and they're all turn into horror, unfortunately. In other words, I just think the social, the human experiment is, is constantly derailing. Mm. <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> Why I make horror movies. I just, I would love to make comedies and, you know, but even some of the best comedies also are getting at certain truths that uh, you're not alive if you're not struggling with the the way life is. Yeah. Oh, yeah. And comedy, getting into social commentary, I mean, that goes all the way back to, well, probably before, but the Marx Brothers. Uh, movies like Duck Soup. Yeah, just absolutely. Duck Soup is a brutal satire. Yeah. Exactly. Yeah. And that's, you know, you have to satirize the powers that be, the people in power. uh I mean, now they do it for themselves. They're yeah. such clown. Uh, yeah. But that itself is a tragedy of modern life, is that everybody has sort of become a media star. So we have our politicians are, you know, like stand-up comedians with mm -hmm. shtick and, you know, saying outrageous things. And, and actually one of the, you know, you talk about writing a horror movie. Like, what's going on with the idea of truth? You know, I feel that there's a certain smugness because we have such a modern world and we're not out there hunting every day mm -hmm. so everybody's just sitting around on their phones and and just creating mayhem they're not really appreciating the the sweetness of of life itself so anyway all this makes me very annoyed they, uh, they, it, it's like so many people are just missing being alive honestly i i honestly i agree with you a hundred percent on that so a follow-up question we, we live in a broken society. Do, do you think we're going to get better? Do you, do you think we can fix this? Uh, no. But if, if you don't try, you're not uh, engaged. You know, I always say, look, the boat is sinking, but you got to bail. Yeah. Uh, to give your self-purpose to engage. Um, but I guess there are other responses to disaster, which is to uh, party like it's 1999, you know, yeah. which, I mean, I believe in a little of that, too. But, no, I think you have to keep fighting for what's right and what's good. And, uh, and you know, you have to keep redefining that. It's mm -hmm. not like there's some easy thing that people are missing. It's just it's a struggle. This is what life is about. Survival and uh, the, the search for grace and dignity. Uh, and, you know, blah, 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 pursuit of love. I mean, it's yeah. all cliches. Everything yeah. I'm saying is a cliche. But, but they're true. So, yeah. yeah. They're true. yeah. 
Oh. That's why they're cliche. <laughs> <laughs> exactly. So to to get less depressing, so you have got. Oh no! Please. Let's <laughs> keep going. You you you've gotten a a lot of acclaim in your in your career. You've won tons of awards. You're filming the last winners in the permanent collection at the Museum of Modern Art, which is seems like an amazing thing to me. I don't know how many how many movies make it there, and especially something that could be considered a genre movie. Um, do you think the awards, the acclaim, are those important to you at all? Is there a part of you that ever thinks, well, when will I win that Oscar? No, I don't think about it. Whatever. I mean... Look, the reality is that my drama is I have this acclaim and I appreciate it very much. And, you know, they say icon in front of my name. Mm -hmm. It's like, I don't know. They just started doing that. I got like a Lifetime Achievement Award at uh, Siches, which is a great uh, festival in Spain. Um, you know, when I was in my 40s, I don't really understand. I think it's because I did mentor a number of great yeah. uh up and coming filmmakers and so on. But what I'm trying to say without self pity is that it's still uh, getting financed is not easy for me. And I make very small films because I'm not, I haven't advanced even the way Ty now has. That's so, that's so, that's so weird to me. I guess I don't understand Hollywood at all because I, if I talk to any, any serious horror fan, if I say your name, they'll immediately name one of your films. I mean, they may not be able to sit there and list your entire filmography, but they'll say, oh, Wendigo, that was an amazing film, blew my mind, or have you seen yeah. Last Winter, right? And I, I would think that would count for something for, you know, the money men. Not really. I mean, the bottom line is if your movies don't make a lot of money, uh, you're in one category, and you can have a claim and, and, and affection and a little pat on the head, but uh, it doesn't... Uh, lead to a more substantial budget. So, you know, I mean, as I say, I'm not complaining, but I'm just making it clear that it's not uh, easy street and that, uh, yeah, but but I get the deal. It's a, it's a business, as they like to say. It's a business, the business of show. <laughs> so if you don't have a bona fide hit, um, and, you know, it's funny, you read press about Ty and they're like, you know, oh, that poor little film House of the Devil, mm -hmm. which is on like, you know, the best 100 horror yeah. films ever made mm -hmm. lists. But but they're like, oh, but nobody saw that movie because it's so tiny. And you just like mm -hmm. you realize the other thing about Marvel and Netflix mm -hmm. is that they've distorted our sense of what a, a movie is or a mm -hmm. success is. I mean, I grew up in the 70s, full disclosure. I'm an old man now, but uh, I you know, there was this idea of, of smaller films mm -hmm. and there was art films. I mean, I don't know how much money Truffaut made or whoever you want to mention, but I'm just saying uh, things have changed the calculus about how we talk about success. And unfortunately, the Marvel Universe has just completely distorted everything. Mm -hmm. it, it was amazing when a movie made $100 million, like oh, yeah. Jaws. Out of, they put out a thing in Variety yeah. saying, hey, Stephen, congrats. Yeah. You, you made it to the promised land. But now, you know, you got to tickle a billion dollars like Maverick or, or The Lord of the Rings or something. Well, of course, those are all fun movies. But I don't know. There's something about the Marvel thing that's getting on my nerves at this point. <laughs> it's they, They've wrecked. So I'm, I'm about 10 years younger than you. So I'm still old enough to remember when movies used to come out and you would hear that a movie was coming out but i lived in a small town so it wasn't playing in the theater here i knew it right. was gonna be in the big cities and in a few months it would make it to my town and i could see it and movies had time to to build an audience and to grow and now yeah. just it's a weekend a, a movie's a big hit that first weekend or it's gone and that's it and that's all there is to it and i don't think there's any room for smaller films to really to to survive in that that atmosphere yeah, it's a, it's just very tragic. And you know, the weird thing now, what with COVID and Netflix, <laughs> I don't know which is more of a pandemic, but um, it's like you don't even know when a movie comes out, or you know if it's actually out. And then 
you know, our, our viewing habits have changed. I'll stay at home and say, I'll watch the whale on TV. Is yeah. it all? Yeah. But then you're like, but I want to respect that it's a, a, a first run movie. I, you know, in other words, the whole model of theater of movie going is also so fractured now. You just don't know where a movie is a, yeah. a, available. You want to celebrate by going to the theater, but then is it, yeah, blah blah blah. So yeah. it's just confusing. Yeah, I, I've yeah. been I've been sitting in mostly empty theaters recently when I go see movies, yeah. which is which well, is that's insane. Well, thing about the pandemic, it's actually great going to the movies. Yeah, it actually yeah, is that's kind true. of. <laughs> <laughs> it kind of is. I always liked like like matinees on a Sunday because oh, yeah, there's just no. very few people, unless you were seeing a kids movie. So those are yeah. always fun. It's. It's nice. Well, I'm the same way, and you know, I like to go to movies alone. I mean, obviously, I have my wife and my kid, and we go to movies. But uh, when I was uh, younger, I would go to New York, and um, I mean, I would I lived in New York, and you'd go to rep houses, and you'd see a double feature of movies that were just five years old, yeah. but they were now in the theater, sort of being rerun, and it was just fantastic. Uh, yeah, yeah, that was a great life yeah see and it seems like most of the art house theaters are starting to disappear too we still luckily here we have a, a very nice one called uh, the book house that's that's nice but they just have the one screen and they're they're very small little family owned so they're only open four days a week and they can't play a lot of movies and they get really interesting stuff not necessarily when it was first release a lot of times it's months later but there, it's great to have ones because so many smaller towns just don't oh yeah that's fantastic man you gotta support those theaters. oh yeah and oh yeah a, it's really a great experience oh the irony is that of course sometimes their equipment doesn't work yeah <laughs> <laughs> and it's that whole uh, thing you're like i could have been watching this at home <laughs> my tv's bigger than the screen yeah. anyway <laughs> and, you know we're really lucky. We have two drive-in theaters. Yeah, we have two drive-ins around here. Oh, yeah. I, I love, love going there. Yeah, drive yeah, drive-ins are great. They remind me of being a little kid. Yeah. Oh, for sure. And I feel like drive-ins, well, first of all, they came back in the pandemic for sure, yeah. which yeah. was fantastic. Yeah. It really was. Uh, but we have a number of them upstate, uh, and it's just uh, it's such a great vibe. It's it's so nostalgic to me. Yeah. It just takes me back to my yeah. childhood. Yeah. Yeah. That's uh that you know, my my parents taking me to see a double feature of E. T. and Starman and being so young that I didn't see all of Starman because I fell asleep less than halfway through, but still it was great. Yeah. Oh, I fall asleep in movies all the time now. That's how I take the movie. That, that is the one good thing about watching at home. If if you start too late and you're tired, you can stop it. I can finish it tomorrow. It's okay. That's good. Yeah. yeah, it's good stuff. <laughs> I mean, it's important in these conversations about, you know, the death of cinema and all that. The reality is that it's. I just don't feel they always make the point that our TVs are considerably bigger and yeah. our sound system so you you're it's not like the old days you'd be watching the tv and trying to adjust the, mm -hmm. the the antenna i mean you are having an experience and an engagement and my son he's 22 now but he grew up watching movies at home he watched the lord of the rings every night for you know years i suppose yeah. so and he likes to watch movies in the house you know that's part of his memory of and and this is a kid who watches all the way through the end credits in other words he loved movies and yeah. cinema the whole thing so you know you don't want to get too crusty and just say everything's terrible yeah that's true so you throughout your career as an actor you, you have worked with a a massive array of interesting directors jim jarmish you've worked with a couple of times uh scorsese neil jordan adam wingard jeremy gardner who i'm a big fan of uh travis yeah. stevens who's having a real moment now uh a wounded fawn just came out and uh we actually had uh sarah lind on the show right before that came out oh, okay. yeah. so do you feel like do directors like working with you because you're a director so you know what they're going through does do you feel like that makes you a better actor to work with directors 
I well, if I'm understanding the question, I do feel like I understand the acting experience. Mm -hmm. I'm extremely sympathetic. I consider it a very harrowing uh, experience being an actor. You know, you're especially you know when you're supposed to uh, cry on cue mm -hmm. and all this deep, deep engagement that you associate with some of the great performances. Um, yeah, I mean, it's a, it's a weird psychological thing. So I really enjoy directing actors because I can speak candidly to them. Mm -hmm. And uh, it's a little side thing of mine, but if I want to have somebody do a sex scene, I'm like, well, I've done that too. And I know where, I know this is a sort of a technical and it's slightly embarrassing and it's not as a... So, you know, there's a great deal of empathy uh, that I can bring to to an actor's experience. And then... Flipping the question, I, I'm not sure what you asked, but, you know, being on other people's movies is mm -hmm. unbelievable, and seeing how other directors work is so cool, and uh, I can't seem to get it on IMBD, but I'm in the new Scorsese movie, which is was incredible, because, of course, oh. he's my favorite director, and I worked with him for several days. The Oklahoma, the one that takes place in Oklahoma, that one? Oh, okay, yeah. okay. What do you play? Who do you play in that? Well, I'm in the coda. It's a small role, and uh, we'll see. I'm pretty sure it's in the movie. I'm told it's still in the movie, but uh, all I'm saying is that, you know, there's just nothing like working working for your mentor. It's not mm -hmm. like seeing, uh, you know, meeting him is obviously lovely, but uh, to, to just be uh, helping him create his mm -hmm. vision, it's just an amazing privilege and of course all the uh the way he works at his age as well and so on so that's great and then jarmish has been really kind to have me back and i got to hang out with bill murray and adam driver i mean you know these yeah. are and then but even ty uh i got to hang out with travolta which was really cool as well as ethan Hawke. but mm -hmm. just in terms of people i grew up uh loving yeah it's very cool. yeah yeah who, when when you're working as an actor, do you have a, a favorite director you like working with, or <laughs> Marty? Oh, okay, yeah. I mean, what are we talking? It makes about? sense. He's yeah, I mean, the coolest <laughs> guy in the world, uh, <laughs> and he's very smart, extremely smart. So, yeah, it's, uh, you know, you're just aware that you're in the presence of literally historically. Awesome dude. When you read um, when you read his writing on film, you you kind of realize, oh, if he weren't making movies, he'd be a film historian because he well exactly really is. that's the thing you're talking yeah. about three dimensional engagement. Yeah. Um, and actually, it's also sweet that he recently has been very supportive of Ty's mm -hmm. movies. Uh, well, anyway, Pearl, but yeah. I he started by seeing X, yeah. and that's just also lovely you know this is sort of the idea of a continuum between you know the work i'm doing and then ty and then ty has this scorsese experience and uh and kelly has traveled amazingly you know she's been judges at con or mm -hmm. maybe that's not true but some of the big festivals so it's just fun you know i'm just in a community of groovy people yeah, that's awesome. I'm just the little guy at this point, but it's awesome. <laughs> you're, you're the big guy in my mind. Just, just that's because no I make horror movies and everybody <laughs> thinks horror movies are so silly. So, um, you you worked with uh, Barbara Crampton not not that long ago on uh, Jacob's Wife, and so that was really neat for me because you're both royalty in the world of horror. Uh, Barbara is not only just a huge star, but I, I, I follow her on Twitter, and I can tell you on Twitter she's just the most fun person and someone who seems to be uplifting other people constantly. Yeah. What's, it, what's it like working with her? Well, I just love Barbara. You know, we did a movie previously called We Are Still Here. Oh, that's right. That's right. I, I have seen that. Um, totally forgot. Yeah. And, you know, that's her movie. She's really got a lot of water to carry in that picture, and I just have a small role. But the other reason that we're pals is that um, we do these radio plays called uh, 
Tales from Beyond the Pale, and yeah. she's done um, more than one of those. So when she, when we're all find ourselves at the same film festival, you know, we would do that. So we've we've worked a lot together, and then she's in my werewolf movie. Oh, outstanding! I can't nice. wait for this. Yeah, <laughs> uh, you know, she just does a day. It's a strange yeah. film because it's like a, a series of episodes. Mm-hmm. So. There's a lot of actors that appear very briefly, but uh, she was fantastic. And, you know, it was a bit of a puzzle to get her uh, get her on the show, but she's just lovely. And so she's a real pal. So when you're directing, you you attract some, some really interesting talent. Um, obviously, Ron Perlman, Connie Britton, Jake Weber, Patricia Clarkson, Doug Jones. Um what do you think draws actors of that stature to your films? Oh, I don't know. It's if they have a free moment. No, I'm oh. not sure. Uh, I think the scripts are trying to be um, realistic and psychologically uh, true. So I think there's something there for an actor. I mean, Perlman uh, famously and famously in my mind He said that he was reading the script for the last winter on his trip to Iceland to join us uh, for the shoot. And he was apparently going, you know, I got to talk. Yeah, I'd never met him. He talked on the phone. He's like, I got to talk to this kid. I don't know what these lines are. It's so (laughs) loosey-goosey. There's nothing that tracks. Hmm. So he was excited to make some changes. But then he said when he was performing it, uh, that it sort of came alive. So what I'm trying to say is that I think my writing is very fun for actors because it's almost, it's so low key. There's mm-hmm. no agenda to the scene that we're trying to advance a plot. It's just, you kind of live in it. Mm-hmm. And then obviously the, this is my trick is that that that's all well and good. That sounds kind of like an indie movie, but no, it's also a, a monster film. Yeah. So, that's the tension is to do like a genre thing, but do it so sort of realistically and almost off the cuff. And anyway, that's just what interests me. I I'm always saying, what would it really be like to meet a vampire to, yeah. to create the Frankenstein monster in Brooklyn? So I'm saying, I think that can be fun for actors once they realize, Oh, I see. I'm really just trying to get as real as possible in this moment, even though maybe the subtext is fantastic. How important do you think casting is to the filmmaking process? Is it, I mean, do you feel like, so I've heard some people say if you cast the right actor, that's 80% of the job. But then I, I've seen other people say, well, I can cast basically anyone with a minimum amount of talent and direct them into the role. Are either of those right? Is it somewhere in between? Oh, I think in life, almost everything somewhere in between. But I do think um, cast it. Well, of course, there are two answers to this. Back to the issue of it's a business. Yeah. So you do want to cast uh, name actors mm-hmm. for the reason of, of financing. Uh, and also, I mean, I watch a lot of old movies and stuff, and I'll always watch a Cary Grant movie. In other words, I do like movie stars. Um, and, and, you know, obviously we all love Karloff and Mm -hmm. so I'm sorry I'm naming such old people, but whatever. (laughs) Also like, uh, modern people too. But the point is, is, uh, so part of me is just like a Hollywood kid. I mean, I, I, in other words, I like movie stars. Mm -hmm. They're movie stars for a reason. Um, but then the other thing is like, seeing a good naturalistic performance is so electrifying and that can come from an unknown or just a regular uh, player. And um, so the bottom line is that acting is one of the great pleasures in a movie. So you want that to, to really sparkle. I'm, I'm very tickled by my new film because there's so many actors who appear briefly that it's almost like a portrait of, art of acting because each one performs differently like barbara is like you say sort of a classic sort of uh, 80s screen queen Mm -hmm. uh, who's certainly brought so much uh, nuance as she's gotten uh older Uh, but then i have 
people like Kevin Corrigan, who's mm-hmm. such an eccentric character. <laughs> uh, Joe Swanberg, who's kind of the mumblecore, that kind of realism. Uh, anyway, it's just fun to see all the different styles, everybody kind of presenting in a different way. So is there is is there any actor that you that you would think is like your favorite to work with? Who's the best actor you've worked with, I guess, is the... Oh, I don't know. That's incredibly hard. I mean, you know, some of my uh, go-to guys, like John Sparadakis, mm-hmm. he's in Wendigo and in many, many subsequent films. Uh, and, of course, Tales from Beyond the Pale is, is a great... I don't know if your listeners know that uh, show, but it's really fun. It's a Now it's a podcast, so yeah. talesfrombeyondthepale.com. We will have that in the show notes and on our website. Great, because uh, I'm very proud of it. I do it with uh, Glenn McQuaid, and, and, but, but many, many artists are involved mm-hmm. in terms of writers and directors and then lots of great actors. I mean, Doug Jones. Yeah. Oh, yeah. He was unbelievable. Yeah. We did a TV show. It was a very brief, like, six-day shoot. Uh, he just brought it. And, you know, at the time I said, Doug, you won't have any makeup. You know, that was kind of my pitch to him because <laughs> uh, he's always. He's deep always. And yeah, yeah, yeah. That's that's going to be a big deal to him. People never see his face. I, I'm sure as famous as he is, as many great movies as he's in, I'm sure he never gets recognized on the street. Yeah, well, that's yeah. probably true. Yeah. Uh, and yet here he is. He's so fantastic. And it's one of my best pieces just because he's so good. And once again, just doing a very, very. uh stark uh wendigo story of course it's a wendigo story <laughs> um so yeah but i i'm not gonna choose my favorite people i work with james legro a great deal and uh I always enjoy that he's awesome uh, yeah and so i really love actors because it's a very vulnerable uh job and it's also craft and, you know, then there's all sorts of little fun things about it, whether if you're good at continuity, if you're what you're tracking or if you're just deep in. So there are different types of uh, performers. And I just find it delightful. And when you yell action, it belongs to the actors. Yeah. They do their bit. And if they deliver, it is the greatest privilege to have captured that on your on your uh on your video machine or your film or whatever you got going. So, uh, your work as a producer, something I was glancing at your, your IMDB the other day, um, getting ready for this. And one, one thing stood out to me as, Oh, that's different. So you're a producer on Rick Alverson's the mountain, which I think is a wonderful film, but boy, is it, it seemed far outside the part of the map you are normally exploring can i ask how you how you got involved in that project uh well i i very much produced the comedy uh which is rick's i don't know third film but uh i had an associate who uh, brought me uh rick's film this script called the comedy mm-hmm which I love to say is a horror film, but it's not that I need everything to be a horror film, <laughs> but it's a, it's a story of a sort of a chubby white guy with great deal of privilege. And uh, it was a certain captures a certain moment before me too. And even the woke thing. And yet it's pushing up against all of that. Mm-hmm. Cause he's this dude in the movie played by uh, Tim and Eric are both in it. Um, it's a really uh, challenging, wonderful movie. And Rick is so smart. And then, uh, you know, we just wanted to keep on together. Uh, and so I was involved tangentially, less and less directly. Uh, in other words, Glass Eye made the comedy, mm-hmm. but then he made The Mountain and uh, what's it called? One other film in, the, in there. Oh, Entertainer. Oh, Entertainer. Okay. Uh, which I was also a little involved in, uh, and I'm in the mountain actually briefly. Yeah, yeah. and uh, and I got to hang out with uh, what's his name. Uh, it was really fun. Well, Gold, who's the star? Of Goldblum the or uh, yeah, Gold, yeah, Gold yeah, 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 yeah. Well, I'm the kid, but uh, Goldblum was kind of uh, I kind of 
uh, just I sort of spent a whole day with him, um, and I found him just so fascinating and and fun. Do you have a favorite horror movie? Uh, well, as I say, I usually cite Night of the Living Dead. Mm-hmm. Um, it's just, it's so visceral. It's so bleak. And I also like to say that it was sort of the fulcrum between the old movies I watched, Black and White, Frankenstein, this and that. And then one night I watched it and I was like, oh, this is a black and white scary movie the music is scary in the beginning there's a graveyard and then it just got more and more bleak and i felt like it fractured my brain and i realized oh this is the future of horror this Mm -hmm. is something different uh this doesn't feel safe Mm -hmm. you know whereas frankenstein as much as i loved it and was very scared by frankenstein as a kid uh it just was a different animal so i always cite that but where do you begin you know, I also like Henry Serial Killer oh, and The sure. Shining, obviously. But so, you know, there's the movies that are just slightly unbearable, like Henry. Yeah. I mean, I've only seen it maybe twice. Yeah. There's Man Bites Dog. There's a number mm. of really fucking brutal movies that. Oh, I Man Bites watched. Dog is. Man Bites Dog is insane. I don't even know how they got away with that. And it's a comedy. That's the part I, that kills me, is it's actually funny. <laughs> Well, it's also great if you're a filmmaker because the whole idea, like, well, we're really sorry that Michael got killed and we're going to dedicate the rest of the movie, but we <laughs> must keep going. You know, all this is so really, uh, it's, as you say, it's a great satire. Um, and then, you know, I don't know. I'm, I'm really curious to see Skinnam, Skinnamarick or whatever the fuck Oh, yeah, I'm curious. I'm curious <laughs> about that damn thing, too. Someone was, yeah. I heard someone saying that it's non-narrative. Which, which is interesting to me. Well, I, I love the idea. I mean, you know, this is the thing about horror, is it's the one place um, that you can make uh, art films. Yeah. In other words, I think, uh, and it's rude, but I don't know the name of it, Skin Uh I think it's um, just, you know, it's just very, very impressionistic, yeah. and I think that's really exciting. Just like I like the, oh, for heaven's sakes, what's the, the Jason Bloom, his original film, you know, that, uh, uh, what was his first one? Oh, uh, you know what I mean? Paranormal um, activity. Yeah. Like yeah, that's yeah. also like a weird comment on cinema because yeah. it slowed everything down. We were so deep into the saw movies and all the, you know, the fast cutting and the extreme, this and that. And then suddenly <laughs> let's just put a camera out here and just watch somebody standing there yeah. by the bed. And you're like, yeah, yeah, it's a, it, it is a, it feels like it's an answer to the Michael Bayification of movies, yeah. where everything is moving so fast you don't know what's going on anymore, and, and the yeah, camera can so never I, sit. Those are fun, and yeah. I feel like horror has the power to reset, yeah. just like uh, Blair Witch, mm-hmm. you know, um, so that's fun, but... Yeah, what, what, yeah, whatever. The Shining, you can't really deny, is just yeah. one of the eternal films. It's one. It's like The Godfather. If The Shining's on TV, you're going to watch yeah. it. Yeah, yeah. I, I watch it every year on Christmas Day. Oh, that's sweet. <laughs> yeah. Now there's a tradition. Yeah, that, that and then we watch Jaws on the 4th of July, so... That's our... I noticed, I don't know if you noticed, but you quoted Jaws. Yes, uh, yeah, yeah. That, earlier. Yeah, that's Was my that yeah, yeah. That's my quint. I if I had a blackboard, I'd pull my fingernails across it. But yeah, that's that's my one little fun go to for my my catchphrase, I guess. Well, just so you know, I caught it. <laughs> I uh, Jaws is uh, it is my favorite movie. I don't. Know. Are you aware of that? No. Nice. I, oh, I love oh, it. So nice. Oh, I love it. So, so Jaws ruined my life because my parents took me to the drive-in to see it when I was four, and I, I was too young to have a solid memory to know that I had seen a movie, but I grew up afraid of water because I had seen a little boy being eaten by a shark, and I did not know that was in a movie until I was like 12, 
and saw it on TV and went, I didn't see that. It was a movie. So, yeah, Jaws ruined my life and also became one of my favorite movies. <laughs> well, it is my favorite movie, and uh, everyone knows it. Uh, and this is a Christmas card, a birthday card someone sent me. Oh, that's <laughs> nice. That's nice. Very cool. That is awesome. I love that. Uh, and I built a Jaws boat. Um, remember, this was the 70s, mm -hmm. so there was no pictures anywhere. There was no internet. And I built it. It's a six or seven feet long. Nice. Oh, damn. It's pretty cool. Oh, that's cool. So I do. I know that you made a short film called Jaws, but I've not been able to track it down to see exactly what it is, and I didn't find any information about exactly what that that film is. Well, all it is is that boat I just described. Okay. I did eventually. Uh, I put it in the water. This was in Cape Cod. And I brought my Super 8 camera, and I took some images of it. And then my friend was supposed to come, and I had built a four-foot shark, but uh, he never showed up. So there's no oh. shark in my Jaws movie. <laughs> <laughs> it, it's a little bit of a buzzkill, I'll be honest. Well, that, well that's, that's kind like of a like... Lot of shark, yeah. Modern shark movies are like that. Yeah, there's, yeah the I, shark's never actually there. So. Yeah. Well, also, they're they're CGI, so they're yeah. not fun. Yeah, okay. yeah. yeah. So. <laughs> Mine wasn't CGI; it was actually paper mache, which I would personally recommend that you don't make a, a shark out of paper mache. <laughs> but I was a kid; I didn't know what was going on. <laughs> That's awesome. That's awesome. Um, so you're you're talking to people who um, all think that practical effects are a hundred percent the way to go in horror, and that most digital effects are bad. So honestly, I might go for a paper mache shark because at least it's an object that has weight and 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 space, and you can tell something's there. I agree. I I agree. Uh, but you know, I look. I like um, I like movies like uh, nice. I like the Godzilla films uh and the jurassic park even though the truly spectacular effects are practical but yeah. you know they, they're pretty good at so mm -hmm. it's i guess my point is is giant reptiles i don't mind being cgi yeah <laughs> but yeah. don't right. you go near werewolves or anything yeah. uh i don't know in our world yeah. um then it's just a disaster they never move right it's like it's like, yeah. I, I saw, and I don't know if you ever saw them, but I got drug along to see the first Harry Potter movie with some family members. And the movie was looking okay, but there's like a troll or something, and it picks up one of the kids and swings him, and I immediately went, is the child made of rubber? Why is it moving like that? That's not how a thing with bones moves. <laughs> That's interesting. Yeah. That's Harry Potter? Yeah, it was one of the Harry Potter movies. Yeah, yeah I don't remember that. Well, I watched all of those because my son is was that age. I mean, that was a good time to grow up, believe me. Oh, yeah. You had Harry Potter and Lord of the Rings. Um, both, obviously, CGI movies. Yeah. But, um, but, yeah, that's why I'm not as... It's kind of like on the level of gore and, and werewolves and, and things like that that I prefer the practical. And, you know, the shark. Yeah. I, you can... You can feel it, uh, but as I say, I'm forgiving of the giant monster movies, and I was a fan of the uh, King Kong by Oh what's... Jackson. Peter yeah, Jackson's I mean, Kong. I thought that was really good. Yeah, yeah. And oh, dude, and the Planet of the Apes. Oh that, yeah, those most recent three. Oh yeah, fucking amazing. It's underrated. That is oh. one of the great series. Ever and the best thing is they just stopped. Yes, they, they did. Yes, they did. They did exactly the cycle and they were done. And those yeah. movies, so I didn't want them. So I love the original yeah. Planet of the Apes, and I'm okay with most of the sequels. They're not that great. Um, and they're doing this, and then the Tim Burton one was not good. They're doing this, and I thought, no, that's a waste of time. They shouldn't do it. But then I saw the first one and went, oh, never mind. This actually justifies its existence. Yeah, I completely agree. And then the subsequent ones are yeah. actually fucking really cool. Yeah, uh, yeah. That Tim Burton movie is discouraging because yeah. I've always had a little man crush on Marky Mark, but he's so <laughs> bad in that. Oh, he, is. <laughs> he is. And then, um, but but actually, uh, 
Tim Roth is, I mean, he's great, and the makeup is really cool. I think it's Rick Baker. Yeah, yeah, yeah. And Tim Roth is always good. I don't think I've ever seen yeah. him give a bad performance. Yeah. Yeah, not, not the type of guy that, that uh, phones it in. So I wanted to shift gears again on you. So an interview I read from you from a few years ago, you had said that you felt exhausted with humanity. Do you, do you still feel that way? Are you kidding? More than ever. That's what I thought. That's I'm sorry. Thought. As soon as humanity gets their act together, I'm, I'm, I'm on their team. <laughs> but, uh, but this is a, a train wreck. And as I say, it comes from a sense of a strange elitism of the modern man that there's nothing, you know, somehow they'll, there's food on the table, there's supermarkets with endless amounts of food, and um, I, I'm not saying an individual person isn't struggling with their finances, yeah. but the bottom line is that we're a privileged species, and we're so wasteful, it's, it's mind-blowing, it's, it's, and, you know, look, I'm not a communist, but I'm uh, – capitalism needs to be uh, given a little slap in the face, mm, in my opinion. Mm. And that's true in the arts. It's true in everything. It's what we've talked about. You know, yeah. they just keep raising the, the stakes. Like now Marvel is the only way to talk about uh, movies. Mm -hmm. That's just a disaster mm -hmm. because – yeah. Oh, anyway. and when someone someone like Scorsese comes out and says, "I don't think that's cinema," and then I get six weeks of the entire internet losing its mind about how Scorsese's an old man who doesn't know anything. Yeah, you I'm know what? Going, he, he made he's good fellas. Yeah. All he's saying is that I want to see surprises. Uh, that that cinema and art is something that is you you are not supposed to be complacent. Mm -hmm. Um, and you know, we, we all know that I'm not saying Marvel movies are, are necessarily bad, but what they are is they're sort of, uh, they're also, uh, a way to insert, uh, cultural agendas into, mm -hmm. into the, I guess the genre of the superhero thing. I don't know, whatever, dude, I, I find superhero a little tiresome. Even though I like monsters, so it's also a matter of taste. So they have made me bored of superheroes. Um, well, that's honestly, it, it, it's boring. there's too much. I like superhero movies, and I thought several of the Marvel movies were quite good. But there are too many. It's too much, and they've made it where I can no longer just I can no longer say, "Oh, they did a Captain America movie. That'll be fun. I'll go watch it." I need to have seen eight movies before that, well, and then to get the okay. payoff, I'll need forty-two movies after that, and it's it's it becomes a chore. It's not. Enjoyment it, anyway. it is. It's frustrating. And I was right there in the beginning. I remember the Avengers was yeah. amazing. Yeah. Was that the second one, maybe? Oh, well, there was Iron Man, mm -hmm. and then, I don't know, Iron Man 2, and then the Avengers, and you're like, oh, wow, this is cool. We're yeah. going to see the new Hulk. Yeah. Because I, mean, I saw the Ang Lee Hulk, which mm -hmm. was, I thought, bananas, and, yeah. and not as some people hated it, but I thought it was kind of fun. Uh, and on it goes. It's like I'm not allergic to superheroes, yeah. but now it's, you can't get out from under it it's too much yeah and and all the other movies are kind of now modeling themselves after the marvel movie and honestly it's yeah it's the same thing that happened when after michael bay got really big and we saw a hundred movies that all looked like a michael bay movie and i just wanted to rip my eyes out hopefully the way that passed this will pass we'll get some normal time <laughs> before the next thing does it yeah, I mean, then there's the tragedy, in my opinion, of TV uh, providing that. Mm -hmm. I'm just not a guy who, and of course, then there's the exception, and I watch a series. But basically, I, I'm resentful of uh, giving so much of my time to a series. Now, if it's something you love, and it's yeah. a great pleasure to say, oh, great, there's a new episode this week. Mm -hmm. So I get it, but just as a sort of a regular diet of, 12 episode or mm -hmm. god forbid three five seasons mm -hmm. it's mm -hmm. it's a lot of a uh, time drain yeah i always use the example of fargo it was obviously a good tv show mm -hmm. my wife loved it and and this and that but i'll watch the movie over and over yeah. i have a fine time watching a yeah. 90 minute movie that's that concise yeah. so and memorable i feel like 
there's a the streaming services especially are they're taking an idea that would make a good movie and it might make a pretty good mi- stretch out to a mini series but they want to make it a series and it just it just drags on forever and i don't i i think stranger things that first season of stranger things they did that was great that was a lot of fun i'm so glad i saw it i i can't even watch the new one it's just too it's too much of my time i have movies to watch an american horror story right I oh mean, yeah yeah the yeah, first yeah. episode of that was yeah. like doing crack cocaine yeah and then it was just the first episode and i was like this can't go on <laughs> <laughs> so uh video games so you have written some video games in the past is that something that you enjoy doing and are we going to see more of that more more video games from you uh, I doubt it. I it was a great experience. I caught Supermassive at the right time. They they interviewed me by some weird chance. They got in touch with me, and I did an interview. And I became slightly aware by the references they were talking about that they might be making a Wendigo story, mm-hmm. Blackwood Mountain, uh, you know some of the other names and it was just a cat and they said would you like to write a spec script uh for this project and i said uh sure Uh, and then i immediately called my pal graham resnick because uh i don't play video games (laughs) (laughs) so he's just maybe more your age he's uh 10 years younger than me and he grew up in the 80s and he played everything from Pac-Man on and you know he'd have more interesting references but so he's just that kind of kid also we were writers together and uh, I produced a couple of his movies he's a sound designer for Ty West and for some of my pictures anyway so Graham and I wrote this spec script and then we got the gig and it was amazing and for like three years we worked on Until Dawn Mm -hmm. and uh, had a great time the two dudes in charge at Supermassive which is a British company they were so hands-on, they were so committed, so passionate about making a horror movie uh, into a video game. And so we all were thinking the same way, a lot of great uh, nights out. And then we started doing the recordings. uh, And then they said, wait, we're gonna go to PlayStation 3, or was it 4? Anyway, the point is, is they literally scrubbed everything and then we rewrote the whole game uh, because now they had better motion capture mm-hmm. and they were going to get more nuance out of the performers so we could strip some of the uh, dialogue out and it would become more and more realistic. And so we spent another year on the game and it was a great experience. And then Graham and I wrote, well, we wrote a sequel, then I was in this really cool uh uh, whatever it's called, you know, 3D one. Mm-hmm. I got a little award for that. I play a mad clown. I turn into a giant penis. You can't imagine, but it's true. <laughs> uh, <laughs> it was fantastic. Uh, one of my greatest performances. <laughs> <laughs> and then uh, we wrote a couple more. And then I kind of faded into the background. And Graham continues to work. He did the mm-hmm. quarry. Oh, okay, okay. The I'm quarry is great. Yeah, I'm, I'm a gamer, and I've been playing the quarry lately, and I love it. Excellent. And, and I just uh, have to take credit for, uh, you know, I always say it's not that I wrote Until Dawn. It's that I hooked Graham up, you know. <laughs> so we wrote it together, yeah. and it was great. But, but the real thing, I feel like I've helped produce that because I, I got them the perfect writer. This kid, he knows genre, he's smart, he's funny, and uh, and he loved uh, video games and really could track with them uh, all the mechanisms of the, of the game design. So there you go. We had a great run. That's outstanding. That's outstanding. So I have one more question, and then I think these two goofuses want to ask some stuff too. Um, my question is... <laughs> If God is real and you meet him, what do we, what do you want to say? Yo, dude, what are you doing? <laughs> I like yeah. expected that response. Yeah. Yo, what the fuck, man? Yo, yo, dude, what up, 
my man, what are you thinking? This is bad news. <laughs> well, have you ended us yet? <laughs> yeah, I don't know. I, I got some issues with the man. But, uh, so, I don't know. Well, I don't think you'd be talking to him. I think you'd be leaving a voicemail because he's obviously not paying attention. Yeah. <laughs> he ain't home. <laughs> <laughs> so josh what what questions do you have for our guest tonight you know to be honest i i knew this is going to be your bag um nate all week has been like i'm going to take all the time i possibly can and i was like well then i'm not going to even worry about it but I, <laughs> I did um uh watch watch several this week just to get ready and and the, i think probably my favorite was was habit i just i love that from beginning to end just the whole story behind it um one thing that I did uh, just love was right at the very beginning, it hooked me in because of your quote, uh, I'm committing suicide on the installment plan. I'd never heard of that before. And then Nate was like, no, that's that's a quote. And it's like, that's they got me hooked. I was like, you know, that's basically, I thought that, but didn't think that the whole time. Yeah. I mean, I, uh, whatever, I guess that is sort of my life story. You know, that character is kind of me and uh hopefully not quite that pathetic but pretty close and you know it's a very personal story and you know i've always been a drinker and i knew that it was i don't smoke anymore but you know i've just had a a low level uh relationship to doing myself in slowly plus there's also the psychological realities of if you're depressed or whatever my strange uh, you know alchemy is so yeah that was exactly. i'm glad you noticed that line because it feels true to this day <laughs> until about two and a half years ago i was a heavy drinker too and depression and all that stuff and um i ended up getting a, a liver transplant so now i have to deal with all of life sober so it's dealing with this this character was like kind of a call home to me it's just oh, really, no really just bad you know in the, in the passenger seat with you and just went through everything yeah, man. Well, Godspeed to you. Uh, good luck with the new liver. Take care of that little uh, item. <laughs> I am. I'm a lot more boring now, but I'm working on it. <laughs> That's all right, man. I did, I'm sorry. I didn't have a question. I just wanted to take out about that for a minute. <laughs> no, I appreciate it. Yeah, no, for sure. I mean, I like that that touched you. It certainly was my... Um, my offering. You know, that's why I tell the kids when I'm trying to mentor kids or advise them or something is that, you know, Hollywood can throw a lot of great stuff at us and, and, you know, that's all wonderful. But the one thing that an independent filmmaker, uh, anybody in their basement can do is tell their mm -hmm. personal story and that, that no amount of money, no writer can, can trump that, uh, tell, tell your own story. And I think habit is my example. It doesn't mean it has to be, personal but you know yeah. tell something that's truthful that is uh the shock of honesty it's really the still it it doesn't require budget awesome casey yeah i got a few um of everything you've been involved with larry what what is the one thing you've been most proud of like what work are you most proud of that you've been involved with uh well, not to be too corny, but, you know, the work I've done with my kid, you know, because it's kind of, it's an expression of what I like to do, which is give people encouragement and help them find their voice. Um, and then, you know, naturally, my own son has made two films, which I'm very proud of. And uh, so that's just sort of the closest realization of the dream and why am i this person it's not that i'm a nice guy or a particularly generous person but i feel like i just want her to uh put out there what i wish somebody had done for me you know which is be uh a supporter a mentor and a producer and i've surrounded myself with cool people and they have helped me in many ways so i'm not saying i've been un unlucky but you know it's quite another thing to have one of those fierce producers or somebody finding you the money, finding you the thing. But, you know, I'm sure it's my personality. Maybe I put people uh, at a distance. I don't know. Anyway, 
So the answer is the kid, but any any of the people I've mentored, I'm really proud uh, that they they run with it, taking advantage yeah. of that opportunity. You know. Yeah. Sure. Um, and then, uh, what are you passionate about outside of the film industry? I mean, what do you what do you what are your hobbies? Um, uh, I like cooking. I'm a terrible sax player and musician. I, you know, I make a lot of music with my pal and, uh, but I really like uh, cooking. I make furniture. <laughs> oh, nice. I just like uh, making stuff. I'm actually sort of bad at everything, but try all of it. <laughs> I, I can't, you know, that old expression, uh, measure twice, cut once or whatever. <laughs> yeah. Like, it doesn't work for me. <laughs> yeah, I feel you. I'm like, I can't get it right, but I end up squishing stuff together. And uh, <laughs> right. so I don't know. I, I just like, honestly, I like living in the tactile world. Um, and, and I think cooking is really important to just at a certain point in the day. I mean, I work all night and all day, but at a certain point you say, this is now we're just going to create a work of art that's going to be gone as soon as we finish eating it. So once again, I'm not a good cook, but I enjoy that. And I enjoy uh, the idea of that's a whole art form in itself. Yeah, I, I find it uh, uh, a little complicated myself. I'm not a good cook at all. I think my wife would enjoy it if I did learn to, to cook a little better. But, uh, <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> for sure. Um, and then... Um, did you always know you wanted to get in the film industry? Like when you were younger, was there anything else that you thought, hey, maybe I want to be a doctor or, or something? Or was it always your your thought to be in the film in industry? Uh, I, I mean, I never – I still haven't decided if I should get into the film industry yet. <laughs> I, <laughs> uh, I was always uh, – I liked acting. I actually wanted to be an actor, but I am too anxious, so I couldn't really like you know the whole idea of these actors who are shy people and then they get on stage and they're comfortable. It's like I'm not comfortable on stage. I'm always <laughs> sure I'm going to forget my lines, and so it's always everything's a bit stressful. But uh, I mean, but ever since I was little, I was making stuff, building things, and uh, well, I built the Jaws boat uh, and making little books with monsters and. So it was just always being engaged with the stuff that I think everyone on this call sort of likes, you know, just monsters and fantasy creatures and design and uh, just the imagination. So that's all it is. And then it just sort of turned into this thing. Well, I do love movies more than, more than plays. You know, yeah. not that I'm not, I'm just saying. So it is definitely something about movies where it seems like it's all the art forms in one. Yeah, agreed. Um, and if you only had to pick one thing that you've done for the rest of your life, so directing, writing, acting, like which one of those is your favorite out of all, all the roles that you filled in, in, in the industry? Uh, directing. Directing. Making the movie and actually, yeah. ironically, editing. Like, uh, that's where I make the movie. Mm -hmm. uh, and and also it's where I, you know, I enjoy people, obviously. On the one hand, it's obvious because I, all this producing and mentoring and so on. But I'm also sort of a private person and I just love editing on my own. I don't have an editor. I'm, maybe people would say I should. I just don't care anymore about all those considerations. I remember everybody always saying, well, you should have a third eye. I'm like, <laughs> it's ridiculous. I don't, I don't need another person. Uh, everything, my thing with humanity is it's all negotiation. And I understand it, it, that everybody has an ego. Sometimes I just want to make my art the way I want to make it. Maybe there's a better version, but what's the better version mean? The one that's more commercial? I don't even know. Right. I, I just want to tell my story personally, try to be honest for a brief second, and see if other people get what I'm saying. And they don't always. I mean, I'm only as popular as I am, so 
it doesn't really seem to be working that well. But <laughs> oh. uh. <laughs> I don't think any of us would think that about you, Larry. So. <laughs> um, I uh, I think the only other thing I had was uh, so I watched that movie Beneath. Uh, and that that giant fish monster. What what the heck was that? Was that like a remote control thing, or how, how yeah, was that dude, built? It's so hilarious. I told them. I said I just need the top. I want it as light as possible so that it can freak people out by through the water. Right. And then it showed up with this fucking boat of a thing, <laughs> and, and and they would like. All day long, we'd be filming with the kids on the boats. And then, like, at 4 o'clock, these two guys, uh, they would arrive, like, from the shore. They'd pull the damn fish. And then we'd have, like, 45 minutes to do one shot where the fish did something. And they had to pull Oh, my God. <laughs> it was absurd. It was nothing I asked for. Uh, I mean, I still had affection for it because it was real. Uh, yeah. And, you know, there's a couple of good shots. But it was, uh, it's funny when you make a movie at a certain budget or, I don't know, I just didn't feel I had enough authority over this thing. This is not what I <laughs> asked for, this incredibly heavy, cumbersome creature. But, yeah. you know, it's it's funny. I, I don't yeah. mind. It looked cool. I thought yeah, it was, yeah. I loved it. I, it, it was worked, a very yeah. enjoyable film. Yeah. Yeah. yeah, and there's some great shots, and uh, but there's another movie that it's not about the fish. Unfortunately, it's about how terrible these kids are. Yeah, yeah, so yeah. That's I true. Always joked. I mean, now you guys will know the reference, but I was joking that this is like the the Congress. You know, these kids. There's a real problem, and they're just infighting mm -hmm. uh, with their old uh, personal resentments. You know, girlfriends yeah. and this and that. And, uh, and I was saying it's just a movie about complete dysfunction and how we can't figure out how to communicate in the face of a disaster, which mm -hmm. in this case was the fish, but obviously climate change and every other problem. Mm -hmm. So it's another movie. Nobody likes that movie or they don't consider it from my first, but actually it's exactly what I have to say. I consider it a satire. <laughs> Yeah. Not, so honestly, I enjoy I enjoyed it. It it feels very different yeah, from the rest of your of your films, but I thought it was I thought it was perfectly fun. I had a good time with it. I think so. I mean, I didn't write it, but I rewrote it. So yeah. a lot of my stuff is in there, or at least you know, my favorite thing is the kill where the rope goes around the kid. Yeah. I did write all that. I made the. I said I'll only do it if I can do this kill. I don't know why I was excited. <laughs> 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 Sometimes you just want to see people die. It's <laughs> yeah, but uh, yeah, I guess that's all I had. Uh, thank you for for answering all my questions. Look at this cool toy I got. Oh, that is oh, an awesome nice. wolf man. That's oh, good, right? Yeah. I think I got it at Comic Con. Oh, that's nice. Damn, that's good. Oh. <laughs> I love them. I don't care. They're all going to make fun of me for loving Universal movies, but No, I love them. So, my for Christmas, my wife got me two 4K collections of so I've got uh, Frankenstein, Bride of Frankenstein, The Mummy, The Invisible Man, The Wolfman, and Creature from Black Lagoon. So good. Yeah. What a treat. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Well, you guys started with this question, but Invisible Man is like that's one of the most incredible ones. Oh, dude, look at that guy. That's crazy. Where'd you get that uh, from, Joey? I actually got that from uh, Books A Million. Oh, okay. Yeah, it's pretty cool. And, you know, and Creatures from the Black Lagoon is actually probably one of the earliest horror movies I remember watching with my parents when I was a very young boy. I love that. I love that. Oh, it's oh, good too. Yeah. Oh. yeah. <laughs> Oh, dude, that's a great. Good for your parents. Nice. Yeah. Nice. I like that. I, I, yeah, love, awesome. I love the creature, and the last movie in that series is so sad. Oh, dude, it's funny you say that. Uh, I got to tell you, well, this is good. I'm going to watch it. I, I've never seen it because I was always annoyed by the creature design by the end. Mm -hmm. but, but I'm sure it's worth seeing. And I think the second one, is almost 
as good or better than the first one because yeah. he's in a, he's in a rural environment. Yeah. It's so cool yeah. when you actually have a monster like looking in a, a, a suburban window. Mm -hmm. It's so scary, yeah. and he throws yeah. that dude on the beach or whatever happens. It's kind of more frightening than the one that's in the exotic location. Yeah. You expect to see a monster when you go to the jungle. Yeah, yeah. but uh, yeah. when he's just one. Uh oh. Suburbs. It's I I love it. That's awesome. Yeah, that's kind of like uh, the upcoming Scream Six is kind of the same way because you're going to have Ghostface, you know, in in the middle of the city. You know, we see in the trailer. Have you seen the trailer for Scream Six? Oh, yeah, it shows him on a subway actually stabbing somebody just in the middle of everybody. Oh, uh, dude, it, well, it, that's of course a, a, an appropriate trope. The Scream movies, when I when they first came out, they slightly annoyed me because I'm always resistant to, but. Uh, they're really fun to revisit. Yeah, and, yeah. Mm -hmm. And they actually maintain, there's not a weak one. Yeah. Well, I think I mean, yeah. the third one is probably the, the weakest, but even it's good. Yeah, I like yeah. it. Huh? What'd you say, Casey? Oh, I, I like it. Yeah, a lot yeah. of people say Scream 3 is trash. I've heard a lot of people say that, but... No, I, I think it's fine. Yeah, I think it's fine. Oh. Yeah, yeah. So what do you think of these new films that are almost just plotless gore. Um, I want to, I want to say like terrifier, um, terrifier two had a semblance of a plot, but the first one really barely does. It's just an excuse for gore. And I was thinking like the only thing I can connect them to is like the old Herschel Gordon Lewis movies, but those had a sense of humor about it. So they didn't seem as, as grim. What do you think about that? Uh, I haven't seen it. Okay. Okay. But the 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 irony is, I I just never had an interest in gore for gore's sake. Yeah. I've already cited two of the goriest movies, uh, Henry mm -hmm. and uh, and Man Bites Dog, yeah. and, and so on, and you know, Irreversible and Ooh, that's a hard Funny one. Games. Although I have issues there, but uh, the point is, is um, yeah, I just I'm not a a body camp guy. Mm -hmm. So I I almost don't need to comment because it's not my scene. Okay. Uh, that's like saying, you know, which hardcore band do I like? Yeah. Well, I just, I'm not going to be able to weigh in properly. Uh, doesn't mean I'm dismissing the genre. Yeah. Yeah, okay. Okay. That makes but sense. But the only thing about, the, what's it called? Terrifier? Terrifier. Is, is that I keep getting put in these articles with that. Oh really? And it's embarrassing because that's a low budget, very very mm -hmm. successful. It's doing really well. Yeah. And then they say, and then there's Fesenden who makes low budget movies. I'm like, well, it's I'm never going to make terrifying movies. Same thing at all. <laughs> <laughs> so that's just embarrassing. That, that's that's kind of weird co comparing the two because they're entirely different universes of movies. Of the type of exactly. movies. Yeah. yeah so. <laughs> all right. Well. Guys, anybody have anything else before we lose our one chance? <laughs> um, no, I don't think so. I just want to, you know, say thank you for, for being on the pod. It's been been a lot of fun. Oh, oh that's yeah. awesome. Oh, man. It, yep. Is there any chance well, that when Blackout comes out, you'll come and talk to us again? Of course, guys. Anytime. Oh. I like talking about scary movies. Awesome. This Why is... Not? This has been awesome, awesome. I cannot thank you enough, sir, honestly. Thanks, guys. I really appreciate you finding me oh. and uh, doing this. You know what? I, I got your email from IMDb Pro, and that's the best $100 I ever spent. was getting IMDb Pro. <laughs> <laughs> All right. So where are you, Kansas? Yeah, Kansas. Kansas and Missouri. Middle nowhere. Yeah. Oh, so, sure. That's fantastic. So Casey lives in a little place called Pittsburgh. I live in a tiny little place called Scammon. Josh is in Kansas City, and Joey lives in Joplin, Missouri. Damn. Yeah. So. What a what a gang. All right. Well, I'm up here in upstate New York. So there you go. Outstanding. Well, thank you again, Larry. Thank you so much. This has been a great night, and we look forward to talking to you again soon. Well, thanks a lot, guys. And I dig the Frida Kahlo. That's kind of oh, groovy. Oh, thank too. you. I didn't even. I didn't even realize what shirt i had on i love frida Kahlo. yeah she she was amazing it's a yeah yeah 
Yeah. Very cool. I love Sorolla's right, painting. Thank you, Larry. Have a yeah, great one. You. Take care. See ya. Bye.